que ya viene la revolución, para que se asustan será pa' mejor. Es el pueblo entero el que ya está gritando, ¡Viva la revolución! Iranian nuclear weapons development. They have turned the island into a communist hellhole. The experiment in Venezuela has failed completely. La bestialidad imperialista. Bestialidad que no tiene una frontera determinada ni pertenece a un país determinado. Bestias fueron las hordas hitleristas, como bestias son los norteamericanos hoy, como bestias son los paracaidistas belgas, como bestias fueron los imperialistas franceses en Argelia. Porque es la naturaleza del imperialismo la que bestializa a los hombres la que la convierte en fieras sedientas de sangre que están dispuestas a degollar, a asesinar, a destruir hasta la última imagen de un revolucionario, de un partidario de un régimen que haya caído bajo su bota o que luche por su libertad. Y la estatua que recuerda a Lumumba, hoy destruida pero mañana reconstruida, nos recuerda también en la historia trágica de ese mártir de la revolución del mundo que no se puede confiar en el imperialismo pero ni tantito nada There was two kinds of slaves There was the house negro and the field negro The house negro, they lived in the house with masters They dressed pretty good. They ate good because they ate his food. But he left. <laughs> they lived in the attic or the basement, but still they lived near their master. And they loved their master more than the master loved himself. They would, they would give their life to save their master's house quicker than the master would. The house Negro, if the master said, we got a good house here, the house Negro said, yeah, we got a good house here. <laughs> Whenever the master said we, he said we. That's how you can tell a house negro. If the master's, if the master's house caught on fire, the house negro would fight harder to put the blaze out than the master would. If the master got sick, the house negro would say, what's the matter, boss? We sick. We sick. He identified himself with his master more than his master identified with himself. And if you came to the house Negro and said, let's run away, let's escape, let's separate, that house Negro would look at you and say, man, you crazy. What you mean separate? Where is there a better house than this? Where can I wear better clothes than this? Where can I eat better food than this? That was that house Negro. This modern house Negro loves his master. He wants to live near him. He'll pay three times as much as the house is worth just to live near his master. And then brag about, I'm the only Negro out here. I'm the only one on my job. I'm the only one in this school. You're nothing but a house Negro. And if someone come to you right now and say, let's separate, you say the same thing that the house Negro said on the plantation. What you mean, separate? From America? This good white man? Where you gonna get a better job than you get here? I mean, this is what you say. I, I ain't left nothing in Africa. That's what you say. Why you left your mind in Africa. The amazing... Malcolm X, Malik Shabazz, the amazing revolutionary who was spitting so much facts, spitting so much truth, and in a humorous, working class way, one of my favorite revolutionaries, rest in power, Malcolm X, somebody who always told it like it is and always spoke out and 
always ahead of his time. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 73, Unmasking Imperialism, Exposing Imperialist Propaganda in Mainstream Media. Today, Thomas Sowell spews capitalist propaganda, exposing Thomas Sowell and his neoconservative political and economic views. We're going to dispel his claim that so-called free market capitalism benefits black, brown, and working class people. And we're going to debunk his false notions about socialism and talk about why people like Seoul are propped up by U.S. imperialism in order to sell their vicious and satanic system to oppress peoples in the U.S. and around the world. And joining me today is none other than the amazing comrade, Dr. Jared A. Ball, professor of communications and Africana studies at Morgan State University in Baltimore. Shout out to Baltimore. Jared is the author of The Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power. Couldn't find somebody better to debunk Thomas Sowell than Jared. Uh, Jared is also the host of the podcast, I Mix What I Like, and co-founder of Black Power Media. Please subscribe to Black Power Media on YouTube, an amazing YouTube channel which can, can be found at blackpowermedia.org. His decades of journalism, media, writing, and political work can also be found at I Mix What I Like. And to my understanding, uh, Comrade Jared, maybe you could talk a little bit about this as well. Um, recently, you have had some censorship or suppression of your amazing journalism and work. Uh, I'm sorry to hear about that, um, but your work is truly amazing and inspiring. And like Malcolm X, always calling out the facts, always calling out racism and classism and capitalism uh thank you so much for coming back on unmasking imperialism no thank you for having me it's an honor um and i think just just quickly i think that the uh the suppression you may be talking i mean i think just in general many of us are, are, are um, uh, facing some in some cases some very aggressive suppression uh i think Maybe what I was referring to was just recently, it just became, you know, I just uh, found out that the Real News Network had removed all of my stuff there. Um, and I did have some, you know, like some really, I think some 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 classic interviews there um, with my godfather, Tom Porter, with, with Don Rojas, and, you know, about uh, his comrade, Maurice Bishop. And then, you know, in particular, we were looking for a sister had contacted me because we had done some uh, a segment on um, uh, uh, rites of passage programs. So, I mean, just some things that, you know, so that was just a personal thing there. But I think, you know, uh, but I am, you know, no question upset about it. But I think in general, all of us who are who are trying to raise certain political questions and criticisms are, are facing some very direct and in, in some cases, indirect um, uh, suppression. Uh, and, and, you know, and like I said, some very aggressively. And, and I think, but fortunately, I think I, and I think we at BPM have not suffered the worst of it. So, um, you know, we've seen, you know, I see peace to Ricky, you know, I see in, in the chat, you know, we know what has happened to hood communist. We've seen stuff happen to AAPRP folks. Um, and then of course it can get even worse as we, you know, uh, uh, and then journalistically, it gets worse, even in the context of the the, the subject today. <laughs> yeah, no, that's crazy. Yeah, uh, shout out yeah. to Comrade David. Oh, damn, not the not so news. Uh, no, sorry, not not the not so new real news network. Yeah, I'm sorry <laughs> to hear that, man. Uh, that's a, a shame to hear. And unfortunately, I mean, that's why it's so good that you're doing Black Power Media. You're doing your own thing. Because a lot of times, my experience as well with a lot of the kind of liberal white journalist realm is that when they'll use you when it's necessary. And the second they don't need you or the second you're bringing any sort of controversy to them, they'll fucking wipe their hands clean of you and they'll dip out. You know, and that's why I think it's important for our communities, our peoples to start our own thing and not be dependent on these kind of liberal, white liberal NGO kind of structures. You know what I mean? And the commercial black and brown equivalents, unfortunately, exactly. Just, just, just real quick, um, the 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 two points of, of 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 direct censorship that I faced at the Real News were a left critique of Bernie Sanders, which was told to me explicitly was not acceptable, oh and God. then when <laughs> when when Daruba uh, Ben Wahad. Shout out to, to to Baba D when he came on and was critical of Amy Goodman and Angela Davis for uh, 
being the the sort of the vocal leaders in discussion of Asada Shakur. And that got completely yeah. removed. It, it never aired. And that that's where, you know, so so but but the other point, and I'm gonna end up talking more about this tomorrow morning, is that is in in, in it, you know, because in response to the black news channel closing, is that the real problem is that a lot of what purports to be the alternatives are following almost the exact same funding model. That mm. there is this elite, often white, uh, or at least non-African, non-black funder that comes in and in you know and i've i've worked with this back in the day you know i mean so it's a contradiction uh and and but they sit on you know when they fund it and it's the same thing with the commercial you know with it's 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 very similar to the commercial world uh when they when they when they're you know when their pockets are opening it's it's great but as soon as you know um and, you know, so it was, you know, uh, and that's what happened at the real news that one funder spoke out and, and that was that. So, yep. um, and these, these things are replicating in spaces, you know, in some cases that I'm not even sure we're aware of, but, uh, you know, so hopefully we can, that's why what you're doing is I think really <laughs> important. And I think that the yeah. sort of circles that we're all working in media wise are really important as, as alternatives to the alternatives. <laughs> I like the alternatives to the alternatives. Mm -hmm. Totally, I totally know what you mean, man. Um, yeah, keep going, keep uh, keep doing what you're doing, and I think um, you know it's their loss at the end of the day. Um, and you're exactly right. You, a lot of these quote unquote alternatives are getting the same funding, same structure, corporate model as the institutions they claim to be against, and that's why it's important to have our own circles, support each other. Uh, and so mm -hmm. please subscribe to Black Power Media and please follow uh, Comrade Jared's work. Uh, today, we are talking about Thomas Sowell, somebody who I have recently come across a lot, especially with a lot of young men. I work in construction and talking to a lot of young men, especially black and brown young men, they always mention Thomas Sowell. They always talk about capitalism and this, this sort of rebranding of neoconservatism with a black and brown face and making it cool to be pro-capitalism and pro-free market. And I just find it interesting because we have somebody like Thomas Sowell who is backed by all of the mainstream institutions. You know, he's a fellow at the Hoover Institution, which uh, that speaks for itself is a, a, an imperialist think tank. You know, he was in the Korean War, fought against uh, Korean peoples, representing an imperialist army, the U.S. He speaks at all the major universities. He uh, worked uh, with Milton Friedman, who was a, a psychopath killer, neoliberal banker. <laughs> Uh, internationalist <laughs> banker who destroyed uh, Chile. You know, so he he's backed by the mainstream, but then you have these conservatives and neocons making him seem edgy, like, oh, he's going against the, the liberals. He's, he's shouting out uh, welfare. He's critiquing all of this. And it's like, you know, the, like, as we enter an era where we see more opposition to liberalism and Democrats and the Democratic Party, uh, we have to also steer clear of moving to the right because I see that happening. Like people, nobody takes Joe Biden seriously. Nobody takes a Democrat seriously anymore. But at the same time, the 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 bad part about that is that's also moving a lot of young black and brown, uh, especially young men to the right where they're saying, oh, well, now the, I'm looking at the right wing. I'm looking at uh, Kanye and Thomas Sowell and Candace Owens for my political ideology. So uh, before we get into kind of debunking some of Thomas Sowell's arguments, what are your thoughts on on his work? And maybe you can tie it also with your book, because I know you, you talk quite a bit about that. Well, I mean, what the argument ultimately what the argument is in, in my book is that black capitalism has been uh, um, and really in the language that you using, I think more appropriately is 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 psychological warfare. Uh, uh, specifically meant to dissuade and discourage the radical organization at, to challenge for political power. So Sowell is is an offshoot. He's a he's a a, a, a pawn or a player in this, uh, and and that's why he is he is positioned by Hoover, the Chicago School of, of Economics, uh, Milton Friedman, as you talked about. Uh, the the Wall Street Journal, PBS, Fox News, you know the 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 the, uh, uh, the, the narrative creators, the worldview creators, those who talk about conquering our convictions, uh, they position him 
uh, to take, you know, and he comes in a long line of Dinesh D'Souza, the John McWhorter, Glenn Lowry. I mean, there's a whole, you know, and of course, traditions that are often attached to Booker T. Washington and, and just going back. Um, and uh, uh, and this is why I think, and in fact, this is where I have, you know, even with with with, with the clip you started with, as much as I love Malcolm, one of the unintended effects of that, that what I think at the time was a brilliant approach to explaining things has taken on its own, I think, kind of uh, ugly uh, connotation that it's been oversimplified to, to whether it's an issue, where, whether it's uh, used, that is the house and field Negro analogy comparison being used to uh, denigrate or to create, a, a, you know, to further confusion around colorism. I think it confuses some of the history around the role uh, those in the House played in insurrection and rebellion, uh, and and it, it has perpetuated some sort of false notions of what it would mean or how easy it would be to be critical of something and then appear to be radical when the criticism, which is easy in its origins, something to say like, I don't like what's happening in the economy. But then the, the, the rightward trajectory after that uh, uh, as you were just talking about, you know, so sometimes, it, you know, again, people will hear Malcolm and just simply say, yeah, everybody in the house was light skinned and a sellout. Everybody in the field is dark and rebellious. And that is completely anti-historical on both accounts. Uh, uh, but then instead of, of starting with the correctness of the analysis and moving leftward, we get dragged into some more conservative reactionary arguments. So then the same, so, so specifically to, to Sowell and his resurgence to me, I, you know, I've been arguing that we should be watching and I, I just haven't put the data to it or found others who have, but there has got to have been a demonstrable uptick in pro capitalist propaganda since the COVID crisis kicked off. Um, I felt it in the sense that that there has there has got to be a way for those in power to make sure that when people start raising justifiable questions about what the hell is going on here that they get dragged rightward so when people raise questions like for instance before the crisis with with what was going on with Trump instead of moving to the left we had people like Ice Cube and Kanye being positioned and 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 promoted and popularized in their very reactionary response and movement towards a Trump instead of you know it, 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 many other better options. So, so, uh, uh, soul and the like, are, they're there to play that role. And I think we're seeing a resurgence of him on YouTube. We're seeing a resurgence of him, uh, in these digital spaces where people are, you know, uh, uh you know, audio books and the YouTubing of his audio book. I mean, all kinds of stuff that I found just trying to prepare for today. Uh, and I'm like, damn, I didn't even realize just how much he has been being promoted in these digital spaces over the last few years alone. Um, when I would have thought a new generation of people like him had to be built up and developed because, you know, I would have thought he, his time had come and gone, but they have found new new life for him. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why, because people are going to look up, they're going to be at, at the construction site or elsewhere, and they're going to be saying, like, this sucks. The economy sucks. The world sucks. And that's a very logical starting point. But if you can just lift your head up and then you got this guy on there, you know, you know, looking like he might know something and he's saying this just absurd, uh, nonsensical madness uh, um, that uh, could not be said by the white men interviewing him without people raising a fuss. I mean, it's just, it's it's in many ways, it's, it's anyway, so those are just some of my, maybe, yeah, you know. No, definitely. Yeah. I think that's a good overview of his impact, his cultural impact and I totally agree. Even just looking up Thomas Sowell on YouTube, there are random channels that have like hundreds of thousands of views just from little clips of his speeches or talks or audiobooks. And it seems like the neocon right wing establishment is really pushing him hard and really trying to sell this myth of free market capitalism because that's really what he's selling, right? He's selling the idea that if you have any problems, it's your fault. It's nothing to do with that's the right. system get over any racism it never existed in the u.s and if you're living in poverty if you're suffering any sort of crises it's because of your individual choice and not because of a systemic issue and i think philosophically this or is worse i'm sorry to cut you differ. off uh, yeah sorry to cut you off it's not it's almost worse than than your choice in, in in many ways he's actually saying that black people are incapable of making another choice at this point mm -hmm. that that it's beyond 
redemption. Right. Sorry. Sorry. So anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no. That, I think that's a that's a a great point, and it's just like it just shows the philosophical difference between capitalist idealism and socialist materialism. In philosophy, we have the two main branches: idealism and materialism. And idealism is basically the idea that I think, therefore I am, that your ideas determine reality. And materialism is the opposite, that material conditions, uh, being determines consciousness. Consciousness does not determine being. If you're born into poverty, if you're born into oppression, you're going to be a result of that. You're going to reflect that. And people like Seoul who promote capitalism have this very juvenile understanding that if you just have the right thoughts, if you think rich, I think uh, it was somebody... I forget who it was in the Trump administration, but uh, he he said, you know, poverty is a state of mind and this kind of nonsense that we're hearing from people like that. So Seoul very much promotes that. Uh, so just to kind of kick off, this is a clip that I found uh, on Thomas Seoul talking about slavery, welfare and and racism. Uh, we'll play a little bit of this and, and get some of your reaction to it. Fallacies. A fallacy is that the current fatherless families so prevalent among contemporary blacks are a legacy of slavery where families were not recognized under slavery. This ignores the fact that the problem has become much worse among generations of blacks far removed from slavery than among generations closer to the era of slavery, yeah. close quote. Explain that. You mean explain why it is so? Or yeah, see, why is that? Why, what, what on earth is going on there? That is so counter to what we, what we assume. Well, first of all, the, 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 the people, most people have not recognized the fact that, in, that if you go back into the 20s, uh, you find that uh, married couple families were much more prevalent among blacks then than today. Uh, you find also, incidentally, that the blacks were, uh, had, as late as 1930, blacks had lower unemployment rates than whites. So all these things that we complain about and, and attribute to the era of slavery, those things should have been worse in the past than in the present. Right. But in fact, they're worse in the present than in the past. And I think if you want to look for a turning point, it would be since the 1960s. And what happened in the 1960s? Oh, you began to have not only the welfare state, you began to have the, 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 the mindset that goes with the welfare state so that there was no stigma any, any longer attached, for example, to being on relief or welfare. And so, but why, well, illegitimacy is exploding now among, uh, it's high among Hispanics, yes. and it's, it's exploding among whites, but the Moynihan report, when was that, Tom? Oh, in, in the, the 60s, 60s. 60, well, 65. When believe. Moynihan talked about the illegitimacy rate among yes. blacks, which was exploding then. So what, if the welfare state changes the way Americans think, yes. why did black Americans prove susceptible to that change first? Because they were poorer. Uh, I, I don't think that many uh, uh, Asian American girls who are preparing to go off to Stanford or Harvard uh, are, are going to uh, say, hey, well, I, I can live on welfare. Why should I uh, uh, abstain? Distinguish the two, race and discrimination. Well, racism is, is, is an attitude inside people's heads. Right. Discrimination is an overt act taking place outside in the real world. Okay. So, now, and so not only with blacks, but you find the same thing with Jews in previous uh, centuries, that that part of the United States where, where there was the most racism against blacks, namely the South, right. is where black construction workers were much more common than they were in the North, right on into the 20th century. Uh, and people, most people are unaware that in the South, blacks were the construction workers. I remember a professor at Howard University saying that when he was a boy in the South, his father uh, pointed to some man on the street and said, he was the first black construction, first white construction worker in this town. And so what was going on there? The racism did not, so, so whites, whites could think of blacks as somehow or other separate, but they'd still employ them because, oh, yes. the, because the market made it profitable to do so. Yeah, in That's fact, in fact, like, yes. In fact, a law had to be passed to stop this because uh, in, the, in the 20s, and particularly in the, as the Depression got underway, uh, black uh, construction companies in the South using black non-union labor would come up to the North and underbid on government contracts, taking them away. And so this was, this, was ver this was very common to the point where they passed the Davis-Bacon Act which said that on government contracts, you must pay the prevailing wage, which meant, which was translated almost invariably into the union, union wage. wage right. so, so your point 
on the distinction between racism and discrimination is don't worry about racism. It's inside people's heads. You can't measure it. Uh, there's a strongly subjective, just forget about it. Concentrate only on discrimination. And the best answer to discrimination is to let markets operate because then people will discover it, it will tend to militate against discrimination. Oh, yeah, when people because... have skills to offer, they'll be employed. Whatever this notion of racism in people's heads is, don't worry about that. Is that right? Yeah. The, the, what, I'm, what I'm saying essentially is that racism, racists may prefer one race to another, but they prefer themselves to everybody else. <laughs> so they'll, they'll do what's profitable. That's right. That's right. Got it. And okay. that, that was even true in South Africa under apartheid, that there were hundreds of construction companies in South Africa that were fined in a government crackdown because they were hiring more blacks and in higher positions than they were allowed to under the apartheid law because that was where the money was. Crazy, crazy stuff. Um, insane. The comments, you guys are hilarious, by the way, in the comments. Shout out to comrade uh, Manny Nile said, um, people seem to flock to people like this because it's easier to wrap their heads around individualistic explanations. It gives them a feeling of control. And that's exactly right. I mean, it's a way to offload any blame of racism. And apparently, I guess in Thomas Sowell's mind, black workers were doing so well prior to the 1960s low unemployment rates you know i wonder why that is uh, and he says welfare is to blame uh jared your reaction to all of this nonsense well also that apartheid was apparently better right for, for <laughs> black south africans so i mean this the, for so the first thought i was having is like who's really watching this and are the numbers yeah. being bought? Are these being falsely generated? Um, are people just watching it long enough so that they can say that they can point to a black man who will support their, you know, racist backwards views? Like, I, who's sitting through this thinking that, that, that they're getting something good here? And then the other part of it is that this is often what happens in these kinds of conversations where, where people like him with some levels of authority will throw in something anecdotal like a Howard University professor said X, Y, and Z, and then come right back with something that sounds a little bit less anecdotal and data-driven, but without any sourcing to say uh, that that uh, uh, the 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 construction industry in pre you know in in the height of apartheid South Africa was somehow hiring this 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 great amount of black workers, like everything was all good. Um, so, and who, like, who would be able to keep up with that? Who's going to, who, who's going to, uh, um, have at their fingertips a response to that with any detail? And I don't think, you know, uh, uh so either they're going to accept it, um, which is likely to be the case, or it's going to be left to, to, to someone of, well, certainly more expertise than I would on the issue, have at the issue, but, or for us to go find it spend time you know to confirm what we already know cannot be true that in context whatever was happening in the construction industry in apartheid south africa could not have been and then if it was better than what's going on today as some argue actually things were in some odd way uh then what is the situation with what's, what's going on now it's not you know that then 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 what has not actually changed uh in the process of exploitation and white supremacy or you know colonial dominance um, which should be the question, but for him to answer that in the way we would want to have it answered would mean he's out of a job um, that that I'm sure pays very well. By the way, you know, in, in some previous work I did on some issue on something years ago on this related to John McWhorter, I, I just was looking this up, and I and and I was reminded that that um, he had an ex aide that is John McWhorter um working for his own institute the, the, at the time, the Manhattan Institute, which is another Hoover Institute kind of thing. Um, and I had actually got this book. Uh, and I, so I was reminded that it, it's a collection of essays similar to what we, you know, what we just saw from Seoul. And the book is titled um, Turning Intellect into Influence. So <laughs> I just, you know, and, and I point that out and only say that from their perspective, they're very clear. That is the goal here. This is not just First of all, again, I thank you for providing the platform so we can have some fun suffering through this traumatic media to, as a collective. Uh, but the goal, as, as they're very clear in stating, uh, in, 
is exemplified in that title of that book, is that they want to shape an argument that's going to be used by those who shape policy and will use this to maneuver the mechanisms of, of government and business to further uh, uh, exploit Black people, working people, and every, you know. Um, so th this is not to be taken entirely lightly. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, who else was in there? I want to... Uh, Clovis, right, 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 right. Barclay, Rose, um, oh, they, McWhorter didn't even make the cover list, but he did have an <laughs> essay in there. Uh, David yeah. from, yeah, all of these, David Brooks. Oh my goodness. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like the Tom Wolf. Good God. Tom yeah. Wolf. Yeah. Oh man. The, you know, so, so, you know, they came, you know, you know, uh, Oh man, I, I just they I, got the they got the I, heavy I hitters had, of I capitalism. A, yeah, I just had a method man thought. Uh, I came to bring the pain. They came to bring the pain. <laughs> they 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 were intending to to turn intellect into influence. Yeah, and that was yeah. Know, anyway, so yeah, that's what like they're trying the, to do. So he's yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, even even the title, right? It's so misleading, and a, a lot of times, like a lot of the word magic that they use for promoting free market capitalist propaganda. They talk about being your own boss. They talk about developing wealth and freedom and liberty. And when you really look into who's actually able to access those things under capitalism, it's not very few people. And one of the things that is so important to study and understand is the dialectical nature of capitalism. I think Walter Rodney does one of the best jobs in how Europe underdeveloped Africa and explaining dependency theory and how the wealth of the imperial core nations, the United States, Europe, in particular, North America, was built on the exploitation of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, which is the periphery. And in particular, Africa, we can't talk about the wealth of Belgium and France without talking about the exploitation, the Holocaust, basically, of millions of Africans in the Congo and Algeria, and so much of the wealth that was extracted from Africa. And a lot of times people within those right-wing capital circles, they tend to view everyone as isolated, that every single person in the world has an equal opportunity to become just as rich as everybody else. And that in theory, everybody could be a millionaire or a billionaire without understanding that wealth is built on exploitation, which Marx also talks about in Capital, that for every dollar that a capitalist earns as a surplus value, that is extracted stolen value from a worker. And I think that's something that they sort of like to gloss over and, and not understand economics. And uh, I just find it kind of interesting that uh, Thomas Sowell skips over that. There's another clip where uh, Thomas Sowell talks about moving from Marxism. He actually identified, by the way, as a Marxist at one point, interestingly enough, and moving to the right. So I'm going to play this and, and we'll talk a little bit more about so that. There's no money in that. <laughs> <laughs> a Marxist. Mm -hmm. You remain a Marxist throughout your 20s. And you've written that you had a summer job in Washington in 1969. Uh, 1960. 1960, I beg your pardon. In 1960, mm -hmm. that helped to, or that, well, that just changed your views on yes. economics. Well, explain that. Uh, I, mean, I was still a Marxist after taking Mil Milton Friedman's course. Uh, but I, I went into, I, but, but one, one summer in the government was enough to let me say, you know, this government is really not the answer. I mean, that is... <laughs> Milton Friedman didn't cure you, but the federal government the did. The federal government did. So no, what, never say the federal government doesn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what was it in, about the job? Well, I, 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 what, my job was to look, look at, to study minimum wage uh, setting in, in Puerto Rico. And of course, there and I discovered that as they kept raising the minimum Department of Labor, or uh, yes. you're collecting statistics for something. Okay. Yeah, All right, got and it, got for it. a poor report. Right. Uh, and and I, I noticed that as they kept raising the minimum wage, the, the, the employment kept going down. And of course, economics was saying that was why. But the there were two theories. The uh, uh, um, the, the, the unions and uh, said that uh, the reason it was going down was that uh, there were hurricanes came through a series of hurricanes uh, during the time they collected the data and that uh, it destroyed the, the sugar cane in the field so there was less required to be processed. And so the question is, which of those is right? Uh, 
And I, and I thought I'd been trained in Chicago that if there are two different theories, there must be some factual thing that would be different, right. at least in principle. So I spent the whole summer trying to figure out what, 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 how would I test this? And finally I came in one day and announced to the little group here in the office that I have it. That what we need are statistics on the amount of sugar cane standing in the field before the, before the hurricane came through. And I'm waiting for the congratulations, and I can see look of, looks of shock in the room, like this idiot has stumbled on something that will ruin us all, you know? <laughs> and I realized I was concerned as to whether this law was beneficial or not beneficial to low-income people. They were concerned because this law was providing one-third of the income of the U.S. Department of Labor. And once you begin to see that the government agencies have their own self-interest, quite aside from what it, whatever they're theoretically supposed to be doing. So they were behaving precisely as a neoclassical, precisely as Milton Friedman would have predicted, they were in pursuit of their own incentives. That's right. They didn't want, they weren't trying to, they were not trying to establish justice on the face of the earth. They were trying to hold on to pretty good jobs. Yes. Got it. Sorry, I was on mute. Crazy stuff. Apparently, in his mind, government is the problem and the free market is a solution. And I want to point out, uh, Comrade David said, made a really great point in the comments. He said, uh, but you weren't working, you weren't in a Marxist government. Exactly. And I think it just shows the basic difference between a capitalist government and a socialist government. Uh, Jared, your analysis and reaction to that. I I, I love it. I, I'm on the exact same page as David, and I'll read exactly what I wrote down as that clip was playing. So a capitalist federal government was supposed to properly represent Marx. He was a bad Marxist, too. That's what so, so, right. so, so if, if you were looking to the federal <laughs> government to represent in a capitalist economy, a society to represent Marx, then you're a bad Marxist. You don't know what you didn't even know what the hell you were doing as a Marxist. So he he on some level, he should not the <laughs> Marxists should be glad he left. <laughs> it's like yep. you weren't helping. You were you didn't understand what was going on. And uh so that was so that's that's exactly it. Um and then and then and then then he seems to suggest well he doesn't seem he suggests that because he said I was most in interested in what was gonna most help working people. So it's not the federal government redistributing endless funds to working people. The solution is the Hoover Institute analysis and Milton Friedman's <laughs> neoliberalism. So like he's, 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 at least when you read Milton Friedman, which I haven't in many years, but I remember at least the vibe of what, what I got when I did is he was very clear. Like he's, like, he wrote, I mean, his book was what capitalism and freedom. He's very clear capitalism is 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 the win this is how you do it we, we dominate markets do this and do that and and austerity and punish and rip people i mean he was basically he's very aggressive in saying what had to happen here so so uh uh, uh soul is either <laughs> he's either really really ignorant even of his own the politics he claims marxist or capitalist or he's just fronting here consciously because there's no way a, a, a Friedman solution, a Hoover Institute solution is going to be beneficial to working people. And they know it. They're very clear on that. They don't, other than to say that broad thing of, um, as I know he has elsewhere, uh, uh, but Milton Friedman was very uh, uh, popular for saying, you know, um, uh, capitalism has increased the the uh, living conditions of, of and raised more people out of poverty than anything uh yeah, so this is on a... some base level they, they 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 take claim for something that i don't even know could be seen as true but um uh, or seen as outweighing the negatives uh or you know but but anyway that's anyway that's that's the extent that they care about the poor exactly of course yeah, exactly yeah Mel, this is a quote by the way Milton friedman he looks like the bad guy in every scary movie. In he looks like the, the evil villain in his office in a spinning chair. Quote, the world runs on individuals pursuing their self-interest. The great achievements of civilization have not come from government bureaus. Well, what about the Soviet Union and the five-year plans that carried out the fastest industrialization in human history? What about the Chinese revolution that liberated 
millions of enslaved women in particular from serfdom and feudalism and, and concubines in, in Tibet. What about the Cuban revolution that liberated Cubans from U.S. back dictatorship? There's so many examples. What about I mean, you could even Angola? But yeah. even here, I yeah, mean, even yeah. here, it's 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 public funding that funds all the research that they then patent and privatize. It's right. it's it's funding in workers programs that created for a time uh, uh, I I impressive, uh, you know, construction and architecture and and technology and electric grid building and, and damming and all the things that you need to to build and advance at least capitalist society. So, I mean, you that's all public funding. That's all. And, you know, so anyway, so, I mean, yeah, uh, never, uh, you know, uh, even if you don't want to attach yourself to the horrors of the Cuban Revolution, you could just yeah. say, you know, look at what happens anytime the federal government gets involved. Good things happen, uh, right. even from the perspective of an American capitalist. That's my not necessarily anybody else, but that's that's anyway. Yeah, and I think it's also one of the idealist aspects of libertarianism, free market capitalism that Sol Friedman and all these other people promote is the non-aggression principle. In their minds, any sort of aggression is mm -hmm. carried carried out by the state is bad, and that in this free market utopia, there is no aggression between people. It's just individual people doing their own individual things without recognizing that force is inherent in the universe. If there is no central government, if there is no state that's maintaining order, there's going to be a private entity that carries that responsibility no matter what. And if we look at right-wing neoliberal countries with very small governments, we see that happen. For example, two examples in the Western Hemisphere that stand out, uh, Haiti and Honduras, which historically have had very small governments. You've had the rise of neoliberalism, coups against people like John Bertrand Aristide, against Manuel Zelaya, and anybody who has tried to expand the government and have a people's movement. And what happens is in places like Haiti or Honduras or in many countries around the world that are free market capitalist systems, instead of a government maintaining order, you have either narco gangs, you have paramilitary groups, you have these different institutions that take over and maintain that order. So it just, sh it just shows you that this idea of the non-aggression principle is complete nonsense. In any society, you're always going to have force. You're always going to have some sort of institution that comes in and, and, and claims power over everything else. And I think it just shows also uh, the satanic nature of libertarianism, where the individual is the 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 individual greed is the highest pinnacle of achievement that it doesn't matter if it hurts somebody else. As long as you're following your individual desires and wants, that that is good. That is greatness. Uh, very much in line with what Nietzsche talks about, the will to power, that society is driven by greed and the will to accomplish more in power individually and not collectively. And it's just anti-scientific. If we look at all of the developments of human history, it's all been collective. I mean, humans are collective social beings. We've only been able to achieve all of these great advancements in science, engineering, through human ingenuity together in problems, right? When we're in a problem collectively as human beings, when we're in crisis, we come together and find a solution. It's not just these individual human beings finding solutions on their own. And I think this is something, this is even within my own family, within people who I know that are not really political, that kind of follow a lot of this capitalist propaganda. They say, you know, greed is human nature, right? I'm sure you've heard that before. And uh, just do you, right? Um, what, are, what is your response to that kind of argument? Well, I mean, to the point you made earlier, whether it made it in a Marxist framework or not, I mean, people are a product of their environment. Um, yeah. Uh, and in fact, most people are not greedy. This is why a few people who relatively are uh, and who are induced to that greed and have any tendency to it that any of us might have um, uh, just stoked and fed and, and encouraged. Uh, but that's why they're able to get away with it, because most people are not thinking like that. I mean, I always think of it like, I mean, the first time I remember I had, you know, as a kid playing a board game, playing the game Risk, if people remember where you're supposed to mass armies and put pieces yeah. on the... I love that game. And I looked, 
but I, I was, I remember I, 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 as a little kid, this, this, I, I looked up in this boy and I just realized he was cheating. He was just like dumping his, his armies wherever he, <laughs> he was just like, whatever, no matter what. And, and, and I, and, and it shocked me. Like it was like, it was, I was so innocent and naive, like, like how I, it would have never occurred to me. And that's why I was slow, so slow catching it. I was like, dang, how does he keep, <laughs> what am I missing? And then, and then it just, re- and then he just started laughing and I got mad, yeah. kicked the, you know, knocked the game over, you know, stormed out. And I don't think we were ever friends again. Like I was like, that's it. That's the you were like revolution. I took it hard. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's it. The game's over. I was like, yeah. you know, I knocked your armies up. But the point is, I mean, I just think in a, in a microcosmic childish kind of, you know, way I'm, that is how I think they get away with it because the rest of us are not that way. If if we were all genuinely that greedy, the 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 species would have died out. Yeah, <laughs> to your point, exactly. the only the only reason we got this far is because people are not that greedy, and tendencies toward that have been checked in the best parts of societies and, and, and around the world. Um, you know, and in 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 others, ch- not checked so much at all, and in fact, encouraged in the other way. Um, so, and then that mythology does come to play, and and is propagated again through everything, through very sophisticated psychological warfare, down to just very sort of aggressive uh, uh, pop cultural film and commercials. You know. I mean, even this just recently with these crypto commercial, the Matt Damon commercial in particular, that that was, you know, even a joke for a couple of weeks was, you know, just this overt. If you're if you're not if you're bold, if you're a real man, if you're tough, you'll get you'll buy <laughs> crypto because that's, you know, right. The, you know, that's how you do it. That's the the bold and the fortune favors the, that, 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 that and all of that. Uh, it's just another another propagated, you know, um, you got to be that. And even the whole thing, I'm even just, you know, just watching stuff about, you know, dogs and stuff, how to best care for dogs and this whole alpha, the whole alpha thing that has been taken mm. into hyper, hyper speed out here in these YouTube streets with being a, yeah. an alpha male and all this other stuff is based <laughs> on bogus research. It's like, and the guy right. that started it said, it's not real. Like he's like, I made up, I messed, I messed up. <laughs> yeah, I've revised you know what I mean? My thesis, and it doesn't matter. The the story's already, you know, the narrative has taken hold. The psychological warfare has has locked in, and people just take it as, you know, to the, to the point you raise. It's just like greed is good, as uh, uh, what's his name said in whichever we call it movie. You know, I mean, that's that's yeah, it's it's, it's crazy. crazy, and and even like in art, it's also reflected with postmodernism because you have these two major movements within art during the 30s, 40s, and 50s, you have the rise of realism, socialist realism in particular in the Soviet Union, China, and and in Mexico, uh, Siqueiros, who was one of the most famous uh, socialist realist painters, depicting very clear images of people working together in groups, collectives, all in one, very clear message, very political working class art. And then in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you had the CIA funding all of this postmodern art where it was just like blobs of paint and abstract and like an eye here and a random can of soup over there that only individual people can understand. And that's where art became very snobby and people were like, oh, only intellectuals can understand it. The cultural cold or, oh, that looks like a really good book. Oh What's yeah, I thought, cause it's, it's about what you're talking about. It's about yeah. the, it's about the post-World War II well, about a number of different things related to that, but in in particular, the way the CIA funded the 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 the, the art world all around the world to do just what you're talking about to to and I was just looking to see if I could find the quick page, but you know I wasn't ready. The and I always refer back to that book; it's one of my favorites. But but they talk about she talks about Francis Stone or Stone or Saunders about the promotion yeah. of individualism specifically to 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 blunt the rise of communism in the world um they even did it to hip hop by the way by yeah. by taking the 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 original elements and and reducing them to the one mc they've 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 wiped out the 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 collective in the art oh yeah, anyway. most definitely and I, it makes me think of like the original uh, ipod ads where it's like you have oh, like wow. even the 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 little letter i 
It's like I pod, I like every I everything is like the little I next to whatever it is. And you have like individual people listening to their individual music. And the hyper individualism of capitalism, I just find to be really disgusting, right? And it's interesting because if you go to other countries around the world, if you go to in particular Asia, Africa, and Latin America, it's much more collective. And in many ways, a lot of this propaganda is designed to break down the collective, break down tribal communities that have existed for thousands of years and promote the individual, have everyone hunched over their screens and not hanging out with people. And it's just crazy to me. I, I, I'm glad you mentioned the psychological component to it because that's such a uh, important part of it. And, and it complements a lot of the economics. Um, this is uh, a, another clip. Uh, this is Thomas Sowell on what America is all about, uh, where he is praising the U.S. Uh, so we'll, uh, this is an excerpt from an essay that he uh, wrote. So I'll play this and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Most of us know that whatever our color or condition, we need only to see the hunger in Africa, the blood in Lebanon, or the Berlin Wall to realize we are better off here. Even among free nations, America is blessed. Deep thinkers don't look at it that way. The very phrase, Fourth of July, can bring scorn to their faces. Anything the masses believe in is suspect in their eyes. They don't compare the United States to other countries, but to their ideals. Every wrong in this country, past or present, proves to them that it is not worthy of noble creatures like themselves. It never occurs to them that tragic wrongs are found wherever human beings are found. Anyone looking for a sinner need look no further than the mirror. Everything human is a failure compared to ideals. To build a beautiful world of ideals takes only an active imagination, some free time, and a nice vocabulary. But the world people live in is the world of reality. And to make that world decent and free takes much hard work, much sacrifice, and many young men buried under a sea of crosses at places like Normandy and Iwo Jima. Ideals have their value, but ultimately ideal visions are a cheap substitute for reality. For those with a cheap substitute to look down their noses at the real thing is a little much. If America could be summed up in one word, that word would be freedom. Those of us who grew up with freedom may take it for granted, but tens of thousands have died trying to get here for it. In just one year, 40,000 people died trying to cross the Atlantic from Ireland alone back in the days of the sailing ships. Even larger numbers of boat people have perished in the Pacific in our own time. The desire for freedom is so much a part of human nature that politicians and deep thinkers try to call other things freedom in order to sell them. They try to call it economic freedom when the government guarantees you food, shelter, and other basics. Prisons have that kind of freedom. So do communist countries. People try to escape from both, often at the risk of their lives. The freedom of America is the freedom to live your own life and take your own chances. The American Revolution was more than a rebellion against England. It was a rebellion against the whole idea that some special anointed could tell everybody else what to do. The Constitution of the United States is pervaded by the conviction that no one is to be trusted with too much power. Long after kings and dukes have faded into the background, other kinds of the anointed have arisen convinced that they should be running our lives for us. All sorts of beautiful things are supposed to happen if only we give enough power and money to the new anointed. If only we surrender our freedom to our betters, they will solve our problems and create social justice. Haven't we heard that one before too many times? Hasn't it been tried already in too many places, from Nazi Germany to Jonestown? Freedom has to be defended every day against lofty rhetoric as well as military threats. We have to say to the anointed, 
Look, you fellows may have your diplomas and high-toned talk, your good intentions and tables of statistics. You may even have some good ideas and suggestions now and then, and we will follow some of them if we feel like it. But we're not going to let you run our lives. Hey, Mac, we're as good as you are. That's what America is all about. You know, can I? Oh, my bad. You're muted yeah. still. <clears throat> yeah, no, cra crazy stuff. Um, your reaction. So it's so interesting the imagery that they pick. Uh, your reaction to that. It, it just occurred to me when he mentioned the the Second World War. Uh, you had that he had served in the military in Korea. Mm -hmm. There's simply the the level. I mean, I did meet people in my own time that mirror this kind of logic, but it it th just as much then it does now. It, it it completely confuses me how people can look at the could experience the level of overt racism in the military if nowhere else in their lives. You cannot go through the military and not. I mean, it's just so blatant and constant, and it, and 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 sometimes violent. So, especially at his time, how in the hell did he? You know, so it's like anyway. I was just you know, but it's just all I just kept thinking was this is just bananas. I mean, this this is this is. Um, I mean, it is a commercial. This is this yeah. is Voice of America. This is. Uh, you know, uh, whatever they would want to describe as some some Soviet style propaganda. This is madness to suggest that 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 uh, anyway to suggest that 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 problems elsewhere in the world are the fault of of the person in the mirror, or that people who are risking their lives to come here are not doing so in large part due to both propaganda and the foreign policy of this country. I mean, yeah. um, I. I yeah, so I'm sorry. That was it. That I was just really kind of stuck on his whole military thing. Like, how in the hell? Like, what? <laughs> I mean, I know he gets a lot of money, but I'm just saying, yeah. like, what? How do you? I just don't. I can't. I really. I'm really stuck on that. I, it is. It, it's always. I'm always confused when people are are. Yeah, I don't know how you. Get, they, I don't know how you can get there. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. When they can say so much bullshit with a straight face, and it's just crazy. I, I think that's a great point that you said that it sounds like it was a script written in the Pentagon, and it's just funny because anytime we have state media and anti-imperialist countries, CGTN or Telesur or RT, they're like, "Oh my God, that's government propaganda." And you hear this what Thomas Sowell is writing. It sounds literally like a, a general in the U.S. Army wrote it. A generic script and one of the talking points that he hit on in that clip he talks about you know blood in lebanon poverty in africa uh, and people wonder why we're better off here it's like well what about in 1982 when u.s was funding israel to attack and invade lebanon and and murder thousands of uh, muslims and arabs what about the u.s colonization in africa in particular leading the coups against patrice lumumba supporting apartheid states like south africa and also supporting the British colonial governments in Africa. And it's a, another thing that they talk about too is, you know, everyone, if America is so evil and bad, why is everyone trying to get here? Well, it's not because of freedom and of these vague notions, it's about economics, right? Everybody's trying to get here because you stole all the shit that everybody else has around the world. You know, it's like, think about it logically and a, a lot of these people don't really understand that it's like they they treat it like the u.s has never done anything around the world to fuck up other countries that's the reason why people come here is because the u.s has stolen and extracted all this wealth uh and resources including uh brain drain i mean that's a big part of imperialism as well with a lot of global south countries where you have a lot of the doctors engineers who, because of imperialism, are granted a better offer in the empire and the belly of the beast than in their home countries, and so are, are forced to come here. And again, it just goes to the lack of 
scientific outlook that a lot of these right wing libertarians have that everything they only understand the individual unit they don't understand things as systems that are constantly flowing and that's why understanding dialectics understanding materialism understanding uh dependency theory and how wealth is built on poverty how cold is connected to hot and how things connect i think is so important and even in the quote that he mentions in that piece aristotle a lot of these people believed in metaphysical philosophy and not in a advanced philosophy that understands things in motion. There's that saying by Heraclitus, you never step into the same river twice. Everything hmm. is always in motion. Everything is constantly hmm. changing and everything is interconnected. And to view things in stag stagnant, isolated ways is just uh, purely reactionary. So that's kind of like, that was kind of like my take about all this, but um, just kind of like wrapping up, uh, Jared, you know, who do you think are good alternatives or antidotes to Thomas? So I know somebody in the chat mentioned uh, Dr. Gerald Horn, which is uh, an amazing uh, historian as well. He has really great books, some of the best books that, that I've seen, especially on the U.S. But what do you think are some important ways to combat this sort of right wing capitalist propaganda? I, I'm not, you know, I don't less than individuals just because uh, my memory won't help but i mean gerald horn is very is 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 as is, is good a place to start as any uh but i think where we started is that in uh the 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 media environment that we are all trying or you know those in these circles are trying to create that's where i think you need to go because it's not um uh I think it's more important that we be in spaces where we're likely to be confronted or be inter interacting with these these antidote scholars and thinkers that you're talking about. Um, but to also see these ideas in motion, as to your point, and working and being uh, 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 discussed and uh, pushed on and challenged and all of that. Um, and also in these spaces where you'll be you'll be encouraged to joining organizations and uh, to Soul's point, becoming that person in the mirror that realizes that they have to get involved and to make the world better and da 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 da. da. But by the you know, the the point that I was wanting to make just just in in conclusion is that what proves Soul wrong are the words. Uh, and the overt, documented, well, uh, not only statements, but behaviors and policies that have come out of those who sponsor him and those who come out of the politics uh, uh, that, that those who sponsor him are working with. So what I mentioned earlier, the, 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 the reference to, to conquering convictions, that's what George Creel said he did to make people in this country want to go into the First World War. That's what propagandists are openly saying they have been doing for 100 and 200 years in the most contemporary sense. We are shaping the public opinion. We are manufacturing consent. We are against people's will, making them redefine their world and as Huey and them said, act in a desired manner. That is the whole point here. So when Sowell comes back with this nonsense, he's again, either ignorant or willfully lying to construct what he knows is an, in, in a, a false narrative because the, 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 the very people, and again, if Milton Friedman is himself wildly clear, like these, are, these, these people were not playing it's just now we have to rebrand it. It has to be reshaped and, and told in a different way, especially right now, uh, because as people are being smacked in the face with a pandemic and a, and a ridiculous response to it or whatever, uh, or ex, uh, 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 um, exploitation of it, uh, uh, people are raising, you know, you can't have them raising questions. <laughs> like, like, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so we have to come back with these nonsense it, narratives talking about people buried up under this and that. You know, any, look, I have generations of folks on all sides of my family that served, myself included, in all this military and went to all these wars. And all of them that survived have all said the same thing. It was nonsense. It was some ridiculousness. What we were said we were there for wasn't real. Uh, mm. And, you know, so so even even on that level, he's yeah. full of shit. 
Uh, so, so, and I hate when people wrap this whole military thing in it, you know, like, you know, we were all there, everybody's been there and we all saw it with some nonsense. So stop again, fronting and running this, you know, this, this hustle. So, um, anyway, man, listen, I, again, big shout out to you and, and the work that you're doing here. And I, and I'm always appreciative to, to, to rock with you on this stuff and, and, uh, look forward to the next time, man. Thank you very Most much. Most definitely. Be, be, before before we head out, if I can, <laughs> if you don't mind me just quickly asking. Oh, no, uh, sure. What, what was your, like, you know, you mentioned you were in the military before. How, at that time period, walk us through mentally, like politically, where you were at and your political transformation. <laughs> did, did that play a role in your radicalization? Because I that's pretty drastic. I mean, like going from the military. I also know other comrades who are in the, in the military. And now are some of the best like revolutionary fighters against empire. What was going through your head at the time? And, and did that play a role in your radicalization? It did. So so the short of it is, is that um, I mean, I was raised in in, in, a, in, a, in a far left of center house, in, you know, home. So, I mean, I, I had a certain starting point. But the reality is I was only in the military to avoid what I thought was going to be a prison sentence. Uh, so it was, it was the fact that I ended up there was like a complete collapse of everything that was supposed to, you know, growing up, my, you know, my mother was explicit in fact, in saying you will not serve. Um, so the fact that I ended up there meant that all things had gone wrong. Uh, but while there, I mean, it just, it, it did give me a chance. The, the positive of it was it did give me a chance to sort of slow down, um, oddly enough and, uh, uh, and to read. And uh, mm. shout out to to my man Malik Assad, uh, uh, brother Malik, uh, who who sort of took me under his wing, and said, "You look like you have a couple cents working in that brain. You should start reading." <laughs> uh, yeah. And I did, and that was it. And then it just became very clear. So um, you know, f- a couple years later, um, it was just a matter of of how was I going to get into this to this struggle. Um, but you can see, I mean, when you I mean, just, just, you know, I do remember, like, I remember I was on an aircraft carrier and I remember they painted on the, on the masthead. Uh, they were very proud of it, that, that our ship alone had dropped 80,000, or was it 800,000? Yeah. I'll go with them smaller number, 80,000 tons of munitions on Iraq. Oh um, my God. Just from our one ship. And there were three in our, in our Red Sea position that were, bombing Iraq 24 hours a day in rotation. So you figure that three times. And I just remember looking at that and it kind of, I was like, wait a minute. I was like, damn, that's what, cause at the time I was just, you know, a glorified, you know, custodian, but I, I was pushing the bombs that would go onto these planes. And, uh, and, and when I saw that get written, I was like, damn, this, that's what's on the other end. I was like, that's, it just, things started. And I was like, this is, this yeah, is nuts. That's wild, man. Um, anyway, so so that's it. You know, uh, um, I did tell my gun captain, if they shoot at us, I'm leaving, because I'm not I'm not dying for this nonsense. And we almost got into a fight. I do remember that was like a point of consciousness I had reached. It wasn't. It wasn't like <clears> a, I, I mean, I was terrified, but it wasn't out of fear that I was saying it. It was out of. And then you know. The, the brothers were saying, I'd rather be judged by 12 than carried by six. And that's the that wow. was the line I always started saying. I was like, yeah. judge me by 12. You're not carrying me with six. A good line. This is some bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Anyway, man, I mean, it's, 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 it's wild. So, I mean, um, and then as I said, and I'll stop here because I really, this is a very easily long story, but that the, the, the amount of, my point with soul was the amount of racism, I, I mean, overt like not the not the 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 soft white boys that I grew up around out here in the suburbs of Maryland. I mean, like the real hardcore. Like, yeah, I, I mean, I don't like black people. Yeah, we we, you know, I I you know, I'll tell you this, and then I'll stop here. My first week on board the ship, this dude from Georgia sits me down. It's 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 five black men and this dude, and he's sitting there and he says, "Look, y'all work for me, and I don't like niggers." Wow, and in fact, we damn. just we just practically killed one where I'm from because he was dating a girl in our neighborhood. But and then he put a thing of chew in his mouth. But if you do what I tell you, when we work together, we'll be good. That was my first week on board. First oh week God. on board. And then he left. 
and the and the and the and the the the, the, the senior dude in the room when he left because I said why why didn't we <laughs> why would why did we jump him even where I'm from we would have jumped him or hit him or something he said he was like that's how we you know that's how we get down that's how it works and that's crazy and and, and that sort of set so I'm like how do you go through and that was in 1990 so how do you go through what he would have seen in in the 50s uh um and and come out of the military like like you have to make a very conscious choice to side up with that and that's that at least you know i would think so anyway yeah. man i you know i i didn't mean to go that long but but no that's that thanks for sharing that i appreciate that i think that's uh you know it's beautiful to see your transformation in many ways it's kind of like you're returning to your source because you mentioned you came from uh, come from a, a, ra a radical left family and then by joining the military you kind of distance yourself away from that but now you're back at a new and higher level as a dedicated revolutionary as a dedicated uh, content creator spitting facts spitting the truth and i think it's cool to see that in my opinion a lot of times not all red diaper babies as they're called tend to be stay within the left or be even some of the most principled people but you definitely came back and came back even stronger which i think no, they uh, said really I went cool, too man. far. <laughs> they said I went too far. You went way, yeah, you went way outfield, but then you I came went back, too far. so it's all good. Nah, but no, they yeah, said I went too far. That. Anyway, yeah. Hey, no, nah, anytime, man. Anytime. I appreciate you and uh 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 and, and, and peace to you to your great audience as well. Um it's been great. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh comrade uh Jared. Uh, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Again, please like and subscribe uh, Black Power Media. Uh, an amazing YouTube channel, and also check out I Mix What I Like and, and Jared's website. He has tons of uh, journalism, media content that he's created over the years, and somebody who has a lot of uh, revolutionary work independent of uh, the white liberal NGOs, the media industrial complex, and uh, keep doing what you're doing, man. I think your, uh, your streams are great. I try to catch them as often as I can when I'm driving to work. Um, thank you so much, man. I hope to have you back on soon. Anytime, man. Thanks a lot. Take care. Peace, everybody. All right, buddy. Thank you so much. Peace out, everybody. Have a great weekend. Take care. Yo, he was dead. He never lived. He died. He died. He died seeking the cause because he said he never saw the cause, but he heard the cause. Heard the crying of hungry ghetto children. Heard the warning from mountains. Heard the tracks to pave new routes to new prisons. He died seeking the cause, seeking a cause. He was already dead. He never really lived. Uptown, downtown, cross town, his body was found all over town, seeking the cause. Seeking the cause for $75 a gate of shoes. Seeking the cause for selling the white ready to black children. Seeking the cause was to be found in Gypsy Rose or JB. Or singing doo wops in the park after some Shiva Chiba. do 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 He died. He died seeking the cause. And the cause was dying seeking him. And the cause was dying seeking him. And the cause was dying seeking him. He wanted a color TV. He wanted a silk on silk suit. He wanted the cause to come up like the mess and take the world serious. He wanted, he wanted, he wanted, he wanted. He wanted to want more wants, but he never gave. He never gave. He never gave. He never gave his love to his children. He never gave his heart to his people. And never did he ever give his soul to his people. He never gave his soul to his people because he was busy seeking a cause. Busy. Busy perfecting his voice to harmonize the national anthem with spirit. He's agony. Busy perfecting his jive talk so that his flunkiness wouldn't show. Busy perfecting his Viva La Policia speech. Downtown, uptown, midtown, cross town. His body was found all over town. Found in the part of fields of an OD. Found in the Bowery with the DDTs. His legs were left in Vietnam. His arms were found in Sing Sing. His scalp was on Nixon's belt. His blood painted the streets of the ghetto. His eyes were still looking for Jesus to come down on some cloud and make everything okay. When Jesus died in Attica, his brains plastered all around the frames of the Pentagon. His voice still yelling stars and stripes forever. Riddle! With the police bullets his taxes bought, he died seeking the cause. Died seeking a cause. 
He died yesterday. He died today. He's dead tomorrow. He died thinking the cause, and the cause was in front of him. And the cause was in his feet. And the cause was in his skin. And the cause was in his blood, but he died. He died seeking the cause, seeking a cause. He died deaf, dumb, and blind. He died and never found his cause because you see, he never, never knew that he was the cause.